Hi everyone, uh, welcome to a Bricklayer's Guide to the Galaxy. Before I came an astronomer, I was a Bricky Hens. Um, Bricklayer's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay, so I've been asked quite a few times to do a little video together on how big is space. And of course, um, it's one of the most perplexing questions out there. I mean, how many people, and be honest, has looked up into a nighttime sky and thought about where does it all end? How far does it all go and how can we work it all out? And how do research scientists come to the conclusions, give us all of this information, help us better understand the size and the scale of our universe? So I've decided to put together this little series of seven, eight minute videos, I guess. Uh, the first one, which is going to follow this small little introduction, is all about looking at the classical ideas to how big space is, looking at Ideas developed by Ptolemy and Galileo and Copernicus, for example, that gives us an idea of scale. And I'll start off the beginning of this first video as well, looking at scale and how our eyes actually work. Not going into too much detail, but a little bit of information on how we see everything the way we do and how it can help us better understand how big space is. And as this series progresses, you know, we'll get into the really meaty stuff. If that's what it is you hear to listen to, then We'll do all of that as well when we start to understand the vastness of the universe and how really and ultimately a question like how big is the universe can we really answer that in any real way to help us understand how big is space so sit back and relax and listen to the first installment and then the second the third ones will be hot on the heels after this one as well. So I hope you enjoy it and hope you're going to subscribe to my channel where I'll be producing more and more material um, and spreading the word about astronomy and hopefully you'll enjoy what I do. So thanks for tuning in folks and um, keep looking up. Space is big. I mean, it's very big. But is there a point in space that it has a boundary where space actually stops? If we look at this picture, for example, we can see a beautiful crescent moon hanging in the sky. And if you just look off to the bottom right, and you should just be able to see a very, very faint dot. That faint dot is the planet Saturn. Now to us, when we look at it, it sort of look like that at the same distance. You can't actually tell whether the moon is in the foreground or Saturn's in the foreground, and it's just very, very small. But it's modern science that's unveiled the real truth, that the moon is of course in the foreground and Saturn is way off beyond that. The point is you can't see it like that. For all intents and purposes, the sky and the things we see in it appear to be flat and two-dimensional. So in this image, Saturn looks as if it's a tiny little speck of dust in the sky. The moon looks way bigger. And the real answer to this is that that's not true at all. We all know, of course, that Saturn is an enormous object, but it's just much, much further away. So does that mean when objects are further away, to us they appear smaller? Yes, of course, that's exactly what it means, and we all know this to be true, because light travels in straight lines, which gives the effect of objects getting smaller the further away they are. In this image, we see Roque appear in Sunderland. Right at the very end of the pier, we can see the lighthouse. But what we notice is that the lighthouse appears to be quite small, when it isn't really at all. If you stood next to it, it would probably be maybe about 70 or 80 feet tall. But in this image, it doesn't look like it is. And we can see the three belt stars in the constellation of Orion. And we can see stars off in the background. But again, we have that problem that the stars all seem to be at the same distance. Claudius Ptolemy was an Egyptian astronomer who lived in the ancient city of Alexandria. And he had an idea into the arrangement astronomically of how the stars were represented. He developed his Almagest, which is the only surviving comprehensive ancient treatise on astronomy. His planetary hypothesis went beyond the mathematical model of the Almagest to present a physical realization of the universe as a set of nested spheres in which he used the epicycles of his planetary model to compute the dimensions of the universe. He estimated the sun was at an average distance of 1,200 Earth radii. 
but only out as far as 20,000 times the radius of the Earth. But clearly, thanks to Ptolemy, ideas started to ferment that the universe was bigger than they ever imagined. Central to Ptolemy's idea was, of course, an Earth-centred universe. It was as if the Earth was the only point of rotation in the entire universe. Nicholas Copernicus was a Renaissance-era polymath whose theory of the universe placed the Sun rather than the Earth at the centre of the universe, in all likelihood independently of Aristarchus of Samos, who had articulated similar ideas some 18 centuries earlier. The publication of Copernicus's book, De Revolutionibus Orbium Caulestium, on the revolutions of the celestial spheres, just before his death in 1543, was a major event in the history of science, triggering the Copernican Revolution and making a pioneering contribution to the scientific revolution. Unfortunately, Nicholas Copernicus died in May 1543, before his works could be published and before they gained the scientific notoriety that they have nowadays. He was correct in assuming that the sun was at the centre of our universe and that the Earth was not the only centre of rotation in space. The proof of Copernicus's theory of a heliocentric universe proved by the arrival of a scientific superhero, Galileo Galilei. Galileo was able to prove through his observations of the Sun, the Moon and Venus and Jupiter that the Sun indeed was at the centre of our solar system. Because what he was actually saying was that the Earth is not the centre of the universe. This was an idea, this Earth-centred universe was a remnant idea from ancient theologies that suggested the divine creator would have had to have created our universe and put the Earth directly at the centre of it all. Because after all, that's precisely what it looks like whenever we look out at the nighttime sky or the daytime sky for that matter. We see the sun, the moon and the stars orbit around the seemingly stationary Earth. This, it turns out, was nothing more than an illusion. The idea of a heliocentric universe gained further credence from Galileo Galilei when in 1609 and 1610 Galileo turned what we now believe to be the first ever telescope towards the nighttime sky. He observed the giant planet Jupiter and realised four moons we now know to be Europa, Ganymede, Io and Callisto, the Galilean moons, were spinning around Jupiter. So you may ask, well, what's the significance of that? Well, the significance is this. If the Earth was the centre of the universe and if that idea was true, then what it actually meant was the Earth was the only centre of rotation in the entire universe. Well then, if this is the case, how was Galileo Galilei in 1609 and 1610 observing the Galilean moons orbiting not around the Earth, but orbiting around Jupiter? A discovery that would quite literally launch modern physics and astronomy into the next generations and inadvertently give us the answers that we require to understand how big is space. Hi folks, I hope you really enjoyed that and thanks for tuning in. It was only eight minutes, wasn't too long, hopefully. The next section is going to all be about understanding how big space is, but through the lens of some of the greatest scientists that we've ever had. People like Albert Einstein, for example. You know, Einstein once famously said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. So we will build on that fundamental point that Einstein makes and reach out in the rest of the cosmos and all of this knowledge that we have at our fingertips to truly understand how big is space. So hopefully you're going to tune into that one and I'll be posting it here. So please follow my channel and you'll see the link pop up and you can press the little bell so you'll get alarms and notifications as to when I post the next video. But certainly we'll be getting that online in the next couple of days. So please uh, join in to listen to more details on astronomy from the Bricklayer's Guide to the Galaxy.